May 17th, 2023. Thank you all for coming. This is uh, our second town hall to talk about the board proposal to sell sell the campground. Before we get started, if everybody would rise, rise for the Pledge of, Pledge of Allegiance, please. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States. So like I said, welcome everybody to our second town hall to discuss the selling of the campground. Um, the first meeting was a very good meeting, very cordial, a lot of, lot of good information was shared, a lot of questions and concerns shared. So uh, as we move forward in the night, I would uh, appreciate the same respect that we, get, that we did the last meeting with the speakers. And, uh, It'll be a good meeting. Everybody will have a chance to, to speak or ask a question at the end of the program. So right now I want to turn it over to our general manager, Tom Schauder. Tom? Thanks, Larry. Uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, as Larry said, we're going to go through um, uh, a certain agenda. We're going to go through some background information like we did uh, last week. This is the second session. Uh, last week, um, Tom Diggs is the community development uh, chairman of that committee, and he spoke. So we had a focus on what the community development committee uh, had recommended and some of the things that they dealt with. Uh, today's focus is financially focused on the 10-year outlook, and Rick Roth at the, uh, the end of the table will be uh, delivering the the 10 year outlook and some of the financials and addressing questions and answers later on with Jay, our board treasurer. Deb Curry was the board liaison on the community development committee. And of course, everybody knows Larry, the board president. Um, <clears throat> Mr. Diggs. So. Did we introduce him? He yeah. did. I don't can't forget I this got guy. Tom. Yeah. Okay. I think good. we got everybody. Um, good. So uh, with that, uh, go to the next slide, please. Next slide. So purpose of the town hall, uh, these meetings are a powerful tool for the community to exchange information. Um, it's an open engagement between staff, board, committee members, uh, and uh, it's the pinnacle of our communications. Um, this issue and the town halls were communicated multiple times. Um, the GM corner has gone out and addressed it. Social media has addressed it. The Flavana Review has addressed it. And we put signs up at the gates. Uh, so if anybody has some constructive criticism on how we can better communicate to the community, uh, we're trying. We got several forums out there and we'll continue to do that. Uh, I want to give a special shout out to our broadcast group. Uh, they make a tremendous effort in recording these events. So these events are record recorded. We think that's a great asset for the community to look at for the next few weeks. Uh, it's easy access on YouTube and Comcast channel 977. Uh, so thank you to the broadcast committee for all you guys do and, and thanks for this. Um, with that, we'll go to the next slide. On April 6th, just a little bit of background, the board held a special open session and they approved board proposal number two. Um, they wanted to host a town hall. We decided on splitting them up and have a focus over two weeks, as I indicated earlier, to address questions, concerns. We opened up an email to the community, campground at lmoa.org. We have uh, posted those questions and answers uh, on the website. Uh, the two town hall briefings are posted up on the website as well. We have hard copies in the back, and we also have a sign-up sheet 
um, not as a roster, but folks that want to speak uh, can sign up to speak tonight. And voting will begin on Monday, May 22nd, and will go through June 16th. So with that, I'll hand it over to our board president, Larry Hanson. Thank you, Tom. I'm just going to touch on a few background, some background information, then we'll talk about the strategic plan that was developed in 2019 to focus on what to do with the campground. But I'll go all the way back to November 1st of 1968. Lake Monticello Corporation, now LMOA, purchased property from Emma Purcell and Charles Alexander. In July of 1976, LMOA transferred ownership of 46 plus or minus acres to Flavana County. LMOA retained the right to use the property for 10 years unless a school was built. On June 18th of 1986, Flavana County transferred 11.45 acres back to LMOA. Flavana County retained ownership of 34.5 acres so that it could be used to build a school. In 1992, Flavana County updated the zoning ordinance to include R4 and LMOA requested to rezone all lots from R1 to R4 and Marino Point lots from R2 to R4. In 2011, LMOA transferred 37.3 acres back to Flavana County in exchange for remaining property that was conveyed on July 1st, 1976. The combined properties were consolidated and became tax map, map number eight, parcel 22A. Current date, when Illinois and Flavana County arranged the original land swap, the 33 acre parcel was never rezoned from A1 to R4, despite that being the intention. As a result, the campground property we own today is a combination of A1, which is 33 acres, and R4, which is 11 acres. So that was just a little bit of background. <coughs> 2019, the Board of Directors adopted a strategic plan. Next slide, please. I'm sorry. To focus efforts and guide decisions on the community's future from 2020 to 2025. The strategic plan was an, in, intended to be a living document that would guide future LMOA <coughs> Board of Directors when making decisions requiring financial resources and have impact on capital needs. If you look at section six of the strategic plan, the objective on that was to commit a course of action that either develops the campground for multi-purpose use or initiate actions to dispose of it as a major asset. And of course, different dates from 2020 through 2023 were different steps in order to do that. Next slide, please. The board proposal, Number two reads as follow, LOA owns some 44 acres off Lake Monticello Road, Palmyra, Virginia, 22963, 245 and 327 Campground Circle, appraised as is for 800,000 plus in 2023. The profit made from selling said property could be placed in a low risk investment fund generating an annual return of three to four percent to increase LMOA's Reserve Fund. Selling the property requires a vote of the membership. Therefore, the Board of Directors pending legal counsel requests that the membership approve the sale of said property for a minimum of the appraised value or a million dollars. As approved on April 6th in a special open session board meeting. I would like to mention that a consent agreement to remove proposal number two from the 2023 annual meet it, meeting balance was circulated and did not pass. Based on the feedback from May 9th, 2023 Town Hall and Community Development Committee. So for, since we're talking about history, you don't have a slide for this one. I just wanna to touch base on something that has been brought up and has been out on social media. And, and I just want to clarify something. Tom Shouter, our general manager, began his endeavor to build a storage 
facility almost three years ago when he was a maintenance manager, not the general manager. You all know Tom. He took that maintenance department and made it one of the best operating departments this lake has had. He vetted plans with a formal GM and the Alamoya board. When we interviewed Tom, we already knew that he had 2.5 acres. We already knew his plans to build the storage unit. The previous general manager vetted this information and went through legal counsel to ensure that there was not a conflict of interest. And we as a board felt after getting our legal counsel that there was not a conflict. So we're here today. Like I said, the potential for a conflict of interest was again reviewed when he applied for the job of general manager. The reason the board saw no conflict of interest is because the general manager takes direction from the board of directors, not the other way around. Tom Shouter cannot decide what is done with the campground. You folks, the community and the board decides that. Additionally, two committees were tasked with evaluating the future use of the campground. Both the Finance and Community Development Committee did not feel storage at the campground was a realistic goal. Their recommendations to sell the campground were not decided upon by one man. So I just wanted, wanted you all to be aware that Tom went through the proper channels. At the time he did this, I was appointed to a committee in the county for, to study transportation. And during that process, also the strategic plan for Savannah, during that process I was involved in a meeting where I saw an application come across my desk about Tom and his interest in doing this. I went to Tom and I went to Steve Hurwitz and they all already knew about it. The process had already started before he even bought the land or got the license to do what he wanted to do. So. Illinois has been well aware of Tom's intentions, and there it, as it stands today, there is no conflict. Tom is, a, Tom is an upstanding guy, and he works for us, works for you. Okay? So I just wanted to clarify that. Thanks, I, Tom. I'd like to add something, too. During the budget process, Tom and Mike actually brought higher increases for storage for both the marina and out at the campground. We kind of said we can't increase that much, especially at the campground because we don't have security and um, cameras. So I, there hasn't been any issue in terms of conflict of interest. I think they've, they've done their job and done it well. Thank you. Mm -hmm. You guys will have to excuse me. My allergies are kicking me. Thank you. So now I'm going to turn it over to... Uh, Rick Roth, our, he's the chairman of our finance committee. Rick. Thank you. Uh, I guess the real purpose I'm here is to give you a perspective from a finance sort of guy as to what uh, this deal means and what we think about when we think about selling an asset. I'm not really here to try to convince you to vote yes or no here, but mostly to just offer some perspective, some background, some information that you can use in making your decision as to whether to vote yes or no. Sort of simple. Not quite that simple, but that's what we're trying to get to. Uh, first slide, next slide, whatever. There we go. Uh, we've talked about this in the past. I stood up here six, seven months ago talking about the 10-year outlook and talking about how our funding plan for the next 10 years to fund our reserve was not quite sufficient and uh, was depleting our reserves. As I think you all know, we spend our dues and our money on operations, which are annual sort of costs that continue, and we put away some of our money for reserves to rebuild this infrastructure that exists right now. That's in fact a law that we have to do that. But this is advanced planning, making sure that 
when things start to fall apart, like the old pro shop did for people who remember what was out there seven, eight, nine years ago, uh, we have enough money in our coffers to renovate, replace, refurbish, whatever you want to call it. We've, we're sitting here in a new pro shop. We renovated the uh, Ashlawn Clubhouse, as you recall. We replaced the pool. That's what reserves are for. And what we don't want to do is get to the point where we need to spend a lot of money and we go over there and we don't have enough reserves because what's our choice at that point? To ask people to pony up a big assessment to help pay for that stuff. So this is part of our long range planning process. And right now, we can see on the horizon that we need to put more money into the reserves. It's a good thing to know now, good thing to know in advance so that we can plan for it and start getting money in there. And what it also means for us is it's hard to invest in new initiatives, to build new things when we sort of have to protect our funds so that we can protect and preserve what we have today. Next slide. I, basically, this sums up a little bit of what we face. The one challenge we face is that dues can only increase 3% a year based on board vote. If we're going to increase it anymore or have a special assessment, the members have to vote for it. That puts a little pressure on it, especially now that uh, inflation is just a tad higher than 3% right now, so costs have gone up significantly. I'm sure none of you have noticed that when you go to the grocery store or the gas station, but they have increased a lot, and that's going to put even more pressure on our reserve things, reserve balances. So what's happening, and you all know about it because we asked for uh, suggestions on revenue enhancers, things we could do to strengthen our financial position now. And a lot of suggestions have been made. There are a number of initiatives underway to improve financial performance, find ways to save a little money. Um, if you recall, a few months ago, we had a vote on uh, putting in solar panels to hopefully save money on electricity. This is all part of the process. Selling this piece of property was one more piece of that process, one more piece of the effort to take a look at and consider relative to what are we going to do with this and whether that's an opportunity to strengthen our reserve balances. Uh, next slide, please. A little bit of ad additional background for those of you who haven't been around here since the 1980s. But when this place was first built, there were not a lot of houses here. People were buying lots, but there was no place to stay. So. Somebody thought up the idea of well, we should have a campground so that members have a place to come down here and use the lake, use the golf course, use the beaches, and a place to stay that wasn't too far away. I know this because my wife and I have stayed in the campground a number of times uh, waiting for my in-laws to build a house on the property they bought here. And we actually enjoyed it. We did use the amenities. We did come out here. Uh, for some reason, my in-laws bought a boat before they bought, built the house, and so we had a boat. And there were a lot of other people who were camping there. A number of people had uh, trailers there that they came down on weekends. It was almost always people who were planning to build within the next couple of years. Well, we all know what's happened since 1982 now. A lot of houses were built. Most of the lots are full of houses. People aren't going to stay in a campground when you got a house to stay in. In fact, as soon as my in-law's house was done on uh, 1985, I haven't been back to the campground. I have no idea what's even there. I would never stay there because it's much nicer to stay in a house. But that's the background. There was a time when the campground was an important amenity to this organization. But over time, that need, that requirement left. So what's, what's gone on is this, uh, this property has effectively become a non-performing asset for uh, LMOA. Now, I know I wasn't here last uh, week, but I did watch it on TV, and a gentleman, I think it was Denny Abrams, who got up, who actually did a very good job of presenting a number of key points, all of, uh, all of which uh, were well thought out, and I really appreciate it. One thing he took uh, umbrage to was me using the term non-performing. 
When we talk about a non-performing asset, what we mean is an asset that's not being utilized within the operations of the organization. Think about a plant, if you are a manufacturer, who changed their manufacturing process and need to retool the assembly line. That doesn't mean the old assembly line and the old tools have no value. It just means they're not going to be used in the operations of that business. That's what we have here. We have a lot of land and we're not using it uh, effectively or significantly for the benefit of the HOA here. Another good example is if you all bought Peloton bikes back in uh, during the pandemic and thought you were all going to exercise and all of that and after about a year you got tired of exercising so you started hanging clothes on the Peloton or whatever. Another example of a non-performing asset. You're not really using it, but that thing still has value. And Denny's right. Uh, the asset we have right now has value. So nobody's saying it doesn't. It's just not value that we're, it's just not an asset we're taking advantage of right now. So that's what I meant by non-performing, and that means we have to consider, what are we going to do with it? If we go to the next slide, and I believe this slide was presented last week as well, there's really four options. <coughs> One is repurpose the land for an amenity. Something that, he, that we build, create, do, that is a benefit to the homeowners within LMOA. Second thing is use the land for a business purpose. Business purpose relative to offering, uh, I think a campground was suggested for other people who camp, not the people who live here, but people who might, you know, come through and want to pull in there and go to a bunch of wineries around here or whatever, but create a business such as that or build a candy store on it or whatever. But that's, that's the second choice. Third choice is just retain the land as an asset. Nothing wrong with that. As Denny pointed out, it's an asset. It may appreciate in value, so it's not really hurting us if we leave it as an asset. The fourth is to sell the land, uh, basically get, li get a liquid asset for the land and invest it for future use. Uh, all, of these oper all of these alternatives have been considered. They've been considered in basic uh, numerous uh, venues, formats, discussions, that sort of thing. The CDC continue, uh, considered a number of these options. and. Um, Tom talked about them last week, so I'm not going to talk about them again, but hopefully you all remember what he said. Just a couple comments on the um, various alternatives. The first is an amenity. Now, amenity by definition means it's something that's fully or partially funded by the association in general, meaning you members and your dues, for the benefit of people that live here. So that's going to cost us something. It's going to cost us something every year to maintain whatever it is, whatever we create. There'll be some costs associated with it, and that cost, that, that money will come from your dues. And then we also may have to invest some money to build whatever we're going to build there. Guess where that comes from? Either reserves or dues. So if you think back to slides, my question to you is, are we really in a position right now to make that sort of investment, to take on these additional expenses? As a finance guy, I would say probably not. Do we think we're going to be in that position in the next two or three or four or five or six years? Probably not. It's what we talked about in the Outlook six months ago. It's where we are. I don't think anything's going to change unless you all, all you members decide to spontaneously vote to pay us more dues. And I don't think that's going to happen either, but maybe it will. I'd like to think it would, but it's not going to happen. Second thing is to use it for an unrelated business purpose. Create a business of some sort and put it there. There's two issues with that. One is that's really not a core focus of an HOA. We don't really want to be running non-related businesses. Second thing to keep in mind is most businesses, small businesses, have a 50, 60 percent failure rate in the first five or six years. That means they go bankrupt or they don't make money or they don't succeed. Now, again, going back four or five, two or three slides here, 
We're not really in a very strong financial position. Uh, part of the Finance Committee is to look at investments. Should we be investing in some sort of business that has a risk of going bankrupt? Should we be investing in a business that's going to take some front-end costs associated with setting it up, um, implementing it? I don't know. I don't think so either. Uh, I think those are greater risks than we should be asking our members to shoulder. So there's really not an option there, I don't believe. And on the amenity side, I said there's really not an option there as well. You, if you remember back, you remember what Tom talked about in terms of the various amenities that they talk, talked about and all of that. And nothing really rose to the top as being something that was really tremendously beneficial to this community. So I would suggest that we really don't, we're not in a position now and probably will not be in a position fairly foreseeable future to invest in an amenity in that property or use it for some sort of business purpose. So where does that leave us? Keep the land, this vacant land, or sell the land and get the proceeds and invest the proceeds. Now, there's nothing wrong with keeping the land. It is an asset. Maybe it'll appreciate in value. Some people think it will. Some people won't. I'm not very good at seeing the future, and most people aren't either. So it may be worth twice what it is now, 10 years from now. It may be worth half of what it is right now. We don't know what the Fluvanna County is going to do in terms of encouraging or curbing development. We don't know what other properties might come on uh, the market and be developed, thereby diminishing the value of this land. But we could certainly keep it. It's nice. Uh, it is a problem in terms of thinking about it as an investment is if we wait to sell it down the road when we absolutely need some funds, when we are facing something that requires refurbishment being rebuilt, that sort of stuff, may be hard to sell it. Land isn't real liquid. Unlike, you know, an investment in a stock or a bond or mutual funds, that sort of stuff where you can get the money back pretty quickly. You don't really know what it takes or how long it's going to take to sell a piece of property like that. So there is a risk that if and when we want to liquidate it, we're not going to be able to liquidate it within the time frame that we need the money. Uh, selling the land, it's pretty obvious. Uh, sell the land, get the money. We use the money, we put it in the reserve accounts, we invest it until it's absolutely necessary, and we have it. Uh, what's the land worth? We have an appraisal that says 800000 We've heard some numbers around a million dollars. If you authorize the uh, board to sell it, we'll start a process to figure out what is the market. What's the best we can do here? What's, what's the demand for it? Is it really worth 800000 or is it worth a million five? If we can get a million five, maybe we should sell it for a million five. But that's a process. There's no rush to go through this process. We don't need to sell it tomorrow. As I've said multiple times, we aren't facing a financial crisis tomorrow. Uh, so we don't need the money tomorrow or next year or the year after. But I pretty much guarantee we're going to need money sometime down the road. And there's really kind of only a few places to get it. This would be one source of getting that money we have the money and we have the ability to access it and we use it in reserves, that means we may be asking you for something less than what we might ask you if we retain the land just to keep the land forever. Um, I think it's sort of a simple question you have to think about. Uh, if we turn this around and didn't have the land right now, and somebody was selling 42 acres on uh, Jefferson, whatever, Lake Monticello Road, wherever the campground is. Um, should we go out and buy it? Would it make sense for us to go out and buy it if we had an extra million dollars lying around? Should we use the members' uh, money to go buy a piece of vacant land to use as either an investment and hope it appreciates or sit there and not use in an optimal fashion for this community. I wouldn't recommend that. Maybe you would.
prefer to do that. And maybe you just like having like uh, vacant land. As one person said uh, in some of the comments, geez, I'd really like to keep the land. And I think we should just uh, get our money from dues, raising dues. We can do that too. If we're going to just keep the land forever, the dues are going to have to be raised higher than they would be if we sell the land and have the money available. A couple other things that were brought up in the uh, town hall last week. One was, are we going to use the money? Yeah, we're going to use the money. Maybe not tomorrow. We're not going to keep it forever. It isn't the purpose of a HOA or this organization to just accumulate cash to sit there forever. It's to use it for the benefit of the community out there. So, yes, we will use it. And we referred back to when we sold the services company, we had $7 million. And I think somebody referred to, well, the board just spent that. I don't think the board spent it. Mm -hmm. The members approved using it to put it into the infrastructure here. So the members made the decision to spend that money. And where did the money go? It didn't just disappear. It's in what we're sitting in right now. It's in where you're swimming. It's in Ashlawn Clubhouse, a much better facility than we had before. <clears throat> so we took an asset that was sitting up here in cash, turned it into an asset that we are using today and is benefiting all the people out there, all the members who um, use it for whatever reason. And that, that's what would happen with these these funds as well, if we were to sell it. So really the choice, and it's not simple, I understand you want to think about it, but should we keep vacant land as an investment, or should we explore liquidating that land, turning it into cash, investing it until it's needed, and then using it when it is needed? And I can pretty much guarantee it will be needed uh, absent some sort of significant dues increase to better fund our reserves. So that's my perspective on the situation. I know some people would like to keep the land. I know people think it's valuable to use for one thing or another. But we really haven't found a situation where it's sufficiently valuable to create an amenity or invest in an amenity here. So think of it as an investment. And the last thing I'd ask you, if it were your money, if you're saving money, if you have a 401k, if you had a portfolio, where do you keep that money? Do you keep it in vacant land? Are you going to go out and buy vacant land as an investment for your retirement? Some people will. Some people are good at that. Some people are speculators. Some people are developers or they know how to do that. That's not a bad decision for them. Is it the right decision for us? That's the question that needs to be asked. And when you ask that, uh, hopefully that gives you a little basis to make a decision as to whether you vote for selling it or vote for allowing the board to explore selling it or vote to keep it as vacant land as an asset. Thanks. Thank you, Rick. Great. Thanks, Rick. Sure. I'll do, before, I'll do before q and a. So the next slide. This uh, is something for <clears throat> for everybody to refer back to. As I said earlier, the campground at LMOA.org was opened up to the community and the residents to express concerns and ask questions. Uh, this website, uh, location, resources, reports, campground appraisal, etc. You can locate the Community Development Committee report that was submitted to the board, uh, the appraisal that was performed is on this site. Uh, this briefing, as well as last week's town hall briefing is there. The questions, answers, and summary of the concerns that we have are on this site, uh, as well as YouTube and the recording of the two sessions are available for you to refer to as you consider the vote from May 22nd to June 16th. Hey, Tom, so, can, I, can I interrupt real quick? Can you go back to that slide? Good. There's a couple other resources. So he's highlighted uh, the reports. There's also a finance section. 
So under the finance section, there is a wealth of information that goes back uh, our financial statements. I pulled one this morning that was December of 2016. There's also annual audit reports that you could look at. Uh, and if I'm not mistaken, the res reserve study may be under the finance tab too. So th there's it's either under that or reports. Yeah. I so think. there's all kinds of information that you can take a look at, and I'm going to talk about some of that in a minute. Great point. Yeah. Yes. Um, so next, uh, the slide summarizes. We're going to uh, provide five minutes for the people that uh, signed up to speak. Uh, we have a timer up here. He wants to speak now. Oh, okay. No, you can finish, so, but I'll, uh, before so, we yeah, start so Q&A. Uh, so after Jay speaks, uh, we're going to open it up to questions and answers. Uh, Larry has the sign-up sheet. Uh, we did have a sign-up sheet for folks that wanted to speak. It's not a roster for everybody to sign up to. Uh, <laughs> so I think we have five or six speakers, and then I'm sure we'll open it up to general Q&A. So I, I wasn't able to be here last week. Rick wasn't <coughs> either. We, we were on vacation. Would have loved to have been here, but uh, did listen to uh, the, the, the meeting. One of the things that I wanted to, uh, to say is I, I've been here for 25 years. I've lived at the lake for 25 years. Uh, I've never used a campground. I have gone over a couple times since I've been on the board just to look at, at the asset, what it's being used for, uh, but I've never used it. I know that we've had various committees take a look at it, but nothing has ever happened with it. Uh, I do want to go back and talk about our financial position. I know uh, Denny, and, and I respect him, he was very well spoken, uh, but I, I do disagree with a number of his points that he made. Um, one that uh, the, the board did spend the money, as Rick mentioned, everything was member voted. So the seven million for the sale of Aqua, there were several different votes. One vote was to pull, I think it was 700,000. It's in the audit report. Every audit report lists everything that was used out of the ERA. And that was to uh, fix the dam. We couldn't get dam insurance. So imagine if the dam burst and we had no insurance, our property values would literally be almost zero. Washed out. Yeah. Now we have dam insurance. We pay a lot for the dam insurance. I, I think, Mike, in the last budget review, I think it's gone up 20, 30 percent over the last couple of years. But I, I do want to say we're in a much better position than we were. If you go back and look at the 2015 uh, audit report, and this is our external auditors, our assets at the end of 2015 were $22,792,000. At the end of 2021, this is our most recent one, our assets are almost $28 million. So our assets have gone up over $5 million. As Rick mentioned, some of that money has moved. We've spent some of that money and put it in assets, but we've got this, we've got the patio, we've got playground equipment, we've got sports, uh, uh, yeah, <coughs> playgrounds. We, uh, tennis courts uh, have been refurbished. Uh, Ashlawn has been redone. Uh, we're looking at doing more on the marina. We've done a lot of good work. When I moved here, a real estate person did not want me to come look at Lake Monticello. And I said, it's got all these amenities. Why wouldn't I want to go look at it? I've got kids. Well, you yeah, know, when you got here, you kind of see that it, it was run down. There was, there was a lot of things that uh, uh, weren't as good as they are now. This is the best that I've ever seen, Lake Monticello. And if you don't believe me, uh, you can look at our appraised values. Everybody got their, I think I got mine in the mail today, the, the tax uh, assessments that we've got to pay. Uh, I was on the audit committee four and a half years ago, and we pulled all the tax assessments for Lake Monticello because we wanted to see 
what was the value of our community? Well, the value of our community back then was $991 million. So all of the homes around here were worth $991 million. You know what they're worth now? They just pulled that recently. $1 billion, $286 million. So our property values have increased 30%. So I would contend, I know some of that's got to do with the market, but if you have facilities that are run down, you don't have a new pool, you don't have a new clubhouse, <coughs> it's going to be harder to sell. And with all these new communities going up around us, a lot of people want to build a new home. But when you look at all the amenities we have here, I mean, I'm glad my, I raised my kids here. And uh, you know, <laughs> my son, who's 32, he bought in here a couple of years ago. So we've got a long-term view of uh, Lake Monticello. So I, I think the board has done a very good job. All the boards, you know, you can point out mistakes left and right. You know, I, you know, I, I was a manager, go into a lot of areas that aren't well run and I'd go fix them. But then somebody could follow me and said, well, he didn't do this and he didn't do that. I mean, everybody's an armchair quarterback. And, uh, you know, there's mistakes that are made, but as long as we're moving forward, I, I feel really good about what we've accomplished and where we're at. Now, as Rick said, we're doing long-term planning. We know, and I did a presentation, a proposal for uh, Prop 1 and Prop 2 back in 2020, and it passed. And basically what we were doing is asking the members to move payment back to the ERA and into our reserves. Uh, so, you know, I know that it was talked about that uh, that's money wasted, but I assure you, it is not wasted. Those entries were made and it increased our reserve balances. We put a plan together. I checked it this morning. We're still on target. I don't know that we will be next year because of uh, inflation, but we are on target to last 20 years with our reserves. We should last 30 years. So we have got to start planning, as Rick pointed out, uh, after 10 years, it's, it starts going down. So you've got to start planning now. Um, we're going to do a reserve study, and I will almost guarantee you that it will be worse because of inflation. Uh, everybody feels that. We tried to build, I think it was a 10 by 15 square foot restroom on Beach 5. We budgeted 50000 the lowest bidder came in at 160000 We got creative, and the maintenance department did a good bit of that work and then subcontracted it out and came in on budget. But we've, we've got to be creative. So I, I think this issue here with the campground, as Rick said, yeah, we can keep it as, uh, as land or we can sell it and invest it. I've did, I've done some numbers, I'm a numbers guy. So it's not just 32,000. If we put it into our reserves, which I would recommend that we do, and we invest it at 4%, it doubles from 800,000 to 1,620 in 18 years. If we sell it for 1.2 million, which we could, and 4%, it doubles in the, uh, from 1.2 to 2.4 in 18 years. So there's ways to do that. And one other point that I wanted to make when we did the R and R program, and this is a real life example of what Rick was saying, that we moved money because the members approved that. We moved money and we didn't sell. The market went down we actually lost, I think, close to a half million dollars because of the sale of the timing. So we don't want to be in a position to where um, you're forced to sell at a bad time. You, you, you kind of want to sell at the top of the market. 
I don't really see a lot of opportunity to improve uh, the campground. We just don't have the extra money. As Rick mentioned, we should be putting the extra money into replacing all of our current stuff. If we did, I, I would love to, uh, to improve that area, but I just don't see it. I don't see us having that ability. I don't see us having the, the staff to do that. We have a hard time with projects. We just don't have any extra staff. So uh, that's kind of my pitch. I, I, would, I will vote to go ahead and sell. That's, I voted to put it on there. Uh, but I do want a better process. I think we've, a process that has worked well for us is getting members off of different committees. Instead of having silos, getting someone from staff, getting someone from CDC, from finance committee, from the board, to really look at uh, selling. W without approval, we can't talk with anybody. I mean, who's going to want to talk to us if you don't have approval? Uh, it's just pie in the sky. But if we get approval, we can really vet out what the property's worth. And who knows, you know, maybe we're going to come out with something better, come out with what the CDC recommends is uh, get a developer that will give us recurring revenue. But without that, um, you know, it's just going to sit there. Uh, I would prefer to be aggressive and look to see what we could do. So that's my two cents. Thank you, Jay. Okay, so now we're going to go into the question and answer forum. We're going to limit it to an hour. Um, residents will present their question, comments, or concerns from the podium. So I'm going to ask, when I call your name, you come up to the podium and so we can record the record, please state your name and your address or lot number. Um, the panel will address the resident accordingly. We will, you will be recorded. You're on TV live. You'll be on YouTube live. Might want to smile. Um, and comments and questions will be limited to five minutes per speaker to allow for the most number of members to speak. So, and after, after the, we have the questions, we'll go ahead and take uh, questions from the audience, if you will. So first one up is Barbara Rohr. Barbara? Hmm? Probably don't look a lot like Barbara. <laughs> Hi, Barbara. I'm going to play an audio clip okay. if this works. It's about two minutes long. Good evening, board members and residents. I am Barb Rohr, residing at 961 Jefferson. We have an awareness issue some people may not know. We own a campground. You may not know we used to own the aqua plant, which we sold for a great sum of money, which we don't have anymore. You may not know what past boards have accomplished collectively, neither do I for that matter. You may not know how to find information on the website. You may not know if the Popper Ashland is open unless they call or use social media, and plenty do not. You may not know we sell social membership memberships to the pool to people who don't live in our community may not know we are vying for a new section of the lake, possibly adding over 100 new homes, which could include 200 cars, along with how many more watercraft. I have questions and concerns about selling the campground. When the ideas came in, yes, I sent several responding to the request for ways to generate revenue. Approximately how many people responded? Of the people who responded, how many said to sell the campground? I believe this is an important discussion point. This is because there seems to be a belief that we, the community, asked to sell the campground in response to requests for ideas. Of the 30 members sitting in the room at last week's, last week's meeting, how many had suggested that we sell the campground? It was implied that somehow those of us attending the meeting had asked to sell. That was a vast generalization. How did we move from forming a committee that successfully fought the development near Tufton Pond to wanting even more development? We should have bought that land and made it a new section of the lake. The paradox is evident. We have been told that we are not in financial strife. What then is the hurry? I suggest we vote no because it was moved to a ballot too quickly. Better still, table this issue for a year or more until members have had time to think about options. Well, thank you, Barbara. Does anybody have any? <laughs> thank you, 
Mike. For Thank Barbara. you. Thank you, Mike, for Barbara. Yeah, right. Does anybody have any comments they'd like to make on Barbara's uh, her comments? I'm not sure how many people said campground. I know we had how many emails? Over 50, 30, 30, 30 emails. I don't know how many of those were camp were campground questions. 39. But, but I know that the CDC committee had over 20, 20 ideas that they reviewed, and selling the campground was probably the most, the one to that would raise the most revenue. Was it? Um, oh. Were there another 20 people that spoke last week, in addition to the ones that? Um, and there's how many questions? 30. 30 39 okay. questions, concerns, comments. Okay. Maybe posted. some of those are duplicates, so maybe we've had 55 comments altogether. I don't know. But I, I, don't, I didn't get, maybe I misinterpreted what somebody said last week, but I, I didn't get a sense that, I, I didn't get that sense that we had been, that people were, um, that somehow or other the CDC or some of us had been asked to ask to sell it. I, I didn't get that sense. So we went out and asked uh, for revenue ideas. Yeah. Uh, right. Back uh, budget time frame. I think that's that was one of them. Anyway, oh. Rick's finance committee vetted uh, a lot of those, uh, so that was just one. I think you know I, I originally had the idea of, of just what the CDC had uh, recommended is is putting additional. Uh, recurring revenue out there, probably bigger lots like the acres or something like that. But um, and, and I'm not opposed to that now. I just I didn't want to put restrictions around us going out and looking because when you put a lot of restrictions around, I, I think you just reduce uh, your opportunities, and you learn a lot uh, by speaking with uh, various people. So. Uh, that's the only reason I, did, I didn't really want restrictions. So as the land stands right now, the way it's zoned, it's A1 and R4, with only 11 acres being zoned R4, and the rest of it is zoned A A1. And because of that, there can, I mean, if, if this happened and a developer or somebody wanted to come in and build homes, it behooves us to try to either, as the lake ourselves, to try to get that zoned R4, all of it zoned R4, or to, um, if a developer wanted to do that, someone that we would talk to, then, and it would have recurring revenue to the lake, that's a difference of somewhere around 35 homes versus maybe 100 to 125. Um, that, that's not saying that would happen, it's just those are the numbers. So it'd be a lot, it'd be a lot higher number if it was all zoned R4, which also means that it would be worth a lot more to a potential buyer. Okay. Again, Barbara, thank you for your comments. Um, next up is Sean Farr. Did I pronounce that correctly, Sean? Thank you all. Uh, I want to, let me just first echo uh, what many people said last week and just express appreciation um, to the board, the CDC, the staff. Um, for all the hard work and efforts for, at transparency that have been put into, uh, into this matter. Um, but I want to address uh, some concerns with the process and then uh, some concerns with the, with the merits. Um, Larry, since I've been down here, I've also heard um, you know, about the campground issue over the years. But I haven't heard a, a clamor to sell the campground. Uh, rather, you know, it seems like it's always been couched in uh, better utilize the campground, and a number of board candidates uh, made statements like that in their in their candidate statement. But I can't recall any board members in their candidate statement saying, "I'm for selling the campground." Um, um, the charge to the CDC that the primary goal in examining the options um, should be to generate short and long-term income. I believe that that inappropriately constrain the CDC's focus and, and, and may pre preordain the outcome. Uh, in fairly short order, the CDC rejected 19 of the 21 member suggestions. Um, 
uh, because they didn't uh, satisfy the goal that was given to them. Um, I mean, of course, the sale of the campground is going to be the winning option if maximizing income um, is the overarching goal. Um, but the strategic plan, Section 6, doesn't say that. It says, quote, develop the campground for multipurpose use or initiate action to dispose of it. Um, so respectfully also, I just, I, I don't believe the membership's been provided with adequate information on which to base this important vote. There are certain basic facts I think should have been expressly provided, uh, not simply uh, a link to website where even then certain key facts uh, couldn't be found. Um, the, the, really the only affirmative information that uh, the association has put out to members um, uh, has been, uh, began with the April 14th GM corner. Um, and um, what followed there was basically a restatement of the board's statement of support uh, for Proposition 2. Uh, mentions the CDC, but it doesn't really offer any details about its deliberations. Um, uh, the email says there are strong arguments that support selling the acreage. Um, and then it you know, identifies the, the, the dollars involved. Um, and then it shares information from the Finance Committee about uh, all of which sounds pretty alarming, by the way. Um, um, deficit spending of $3.6 over the next 10 years. Reducing cash available by 75%. Reserve fund dropping to an unhealthy level. Um, and then the ominous statement, property values can decrease if an HOA is deemed unstable or unhealthy. And then the email closed with this. Uh, we are looking to see if a town hall meeting uh, can be scheduled in May ahead of the vote. Um, and that, by the way, is why I immediately did whatever research I could and went ahead and composed a letter uh, to the Fluvanna Review because it wasn't certain it was going to be uh, a town hall. And <coughs> it's certainly commendable that you have had uh, not one but two. Um, so. I hope you can see where I'm going here. Uh, wittingly or unwittingly, um, the information affirmatively provided by our association to members is kind of setting the table for members to conclude, oh my gosh, okay, you got my attention here. Um, sounds like the sale's the only thing to do and we better do it fast. Um, I'm sure unwitting, I, I'm not a conspiracy theorist. I don't think anybody here was putting the fix in, okay? But I'm just saying the way, the way it rolled out um, is kind of only one side. It's in support of the board's recommendation to sell. Okay, so what did I do? Uh, I went straight to the CDC link to learn more, but I found that I first needed to go to the county's uh, website to educate myself about all this zoning and rezoning stuff. What does that mean on the ground for us uh, with this sale? Um, and there were some really important facts that I found in both of those places, ours and the county's, um, that all the membership ought to know, but I and a few others had to dig out. Here are some of them, that while some houses might be currently allowed at the, at the campground site, the change in zoning would allow 100 plus uh, additional houses. Uh, second, all of those new houses would be part of LMOA. Um, with the same right of access to and use of the lake amenities. Three, all of them would rely on current aqua uh, water and sewer services. And four, yes, the CDC recommended sale um, to a developer, but in its report, and its members underscored this last week, it, was, it did so only with strict conditions that it considered critical. Um, may I? Keep going. Okay. So, those were that all new lots ought to be for residential, single-family, detached housing. At least 20% of the property should be re remain as open space and available to all LMOA members. And the developer must provide a 50-foot tree buffer on Lake Monticello Road. Highly, all of these were, I think, highly, ascertain highly relevant and ascertainable facts um, that I feel like our association should have provided us um, but we're not. Um, so at the town hall then, we learned two additional significant facts, um, but only by watching the town hall. None of the conditions the CDC deemed critical in its recommendation are included in the ballot statement. 
It's asking us to, quote, approve the sale of said property at a minimum price of not less than the appraised value, period. Uh, so if you get a positive vote, Nothing is binding on the board to stand fast to any of the CDC conditions. And um, R4, by the way, one of the things that I learned there, R4 can include townhouses, duplexes, multifamily properties, right? So absent a binding condition, um, those, rec those, those recommended conditions could go out the window. Uh, I, I, I heard you last week, Larry, I know that's not the intent, but you did have to acknowledge that the ballot statement as presented, no conditions, no obligation to come back uh, to, to the members. Um, last thing um, we learned with the, that there's, there's in fact no sense of urgency, no dire financial imperative to act now. The only thing apparently driving that was uh, that, that, that the strategic plan section six <coughs> recommends a decision be made in 2023. And here we are. Um, so on the merits, last things, I, I, I just find it very dismaying that there <coughs> seems to have been no analysis of what the impact will be on our lake amenities of adding 100, maybe 120 uh, new homes. What's it mean for golfers? What's it mean for boaters? What's it mean for uh, uh, being able to rent a slip? Um, the pool, the beaches. Um, Ms. Henry's last uh, piece on the um, upcoming 4th of July uh, festivities said, last year we were more packed than ever. And I saw you there, you know, I mean, we were in the beach, the beach as well. So let's throw 100 plus more homes into that mix. Um, there's been no analysis that I can see of, of what that might be, um, nor has there been any consideration given to the fact that there are some 400 of what I would call legacy Lake Monticello properties, undeveloped lots that are here and owned uh, by somebody. Um, shouldn't they be assured that their eventual access to amenities won't be degraded by the addition of 100 plus homes? And, and shouldn't the additional demand that they represent um, on our amenities and on Aqua have some sort of seniority uh, over houses constructed in, in this decade? Uh, I think so. So finally, I mentioned Aqua. Demand on Aqua doesn't appear to have been thoroughly examined. The facility was built um, by LMOA to serve the 4,600 homes that would eventually be built on lake property as part of the lake development. But it was sold in 2007. Um, uh, Ms. Curry, is that how you pronounce your name? I'm sorry. Yes, sir. Um, you put on the record last week that since that time, and we, we, we've all been able to see it, some 1,400 new homes have been added outside the lake that are being served by that aqua facility that was intended to be for the lake properties. Um, so the demand for those uh, services, um, you know, it, this, this, is, this is coming at the same time that you've got more and more members reporting service issues with Aqua, and then you got another set of members reporting that they're smelling the stink like they never did before. Um, so, I, you know, I, I just think knowing our vote will result in 100 plus additional homes. Um, and knowing there are all these undeveloped lots here at the lake, um, shouldn't the board provide us with tangible assurances that all those questions have been examined um, and with the results of that analysis before you ask us to, to make this vote, take this vote? Uh, I think so. So I just, you know, with all due respect, I just think that this uh, proposal is not yet ready for prime time. Thank you. Thank you, Sean. Appreciate it. Do you As, yeah, Sean, I, I'd, I'd like to make some, some comments to that. Um, you know, it, in a lot of respects, you're right. It's not necessarily ready for prime time, but I don't know that we'll get ready for prime time if we can't explore uh, the sale of it. And by the way, it doesn't include 100. We didn't put any restrictions. There's a property that's going to close tomorrow 
that's going to put one house on uh, uh, right across from Tuf Tufton Pond. It, it was uh, 17 acres. We'll find out tomorrow how much it's sold for, but that'll be another piece of, of information on there. So I, I don't know that it'll be houses. That's why we didn't put any restrictions. I know the CDC wanted restrictions. The Finance Committee didn't. We're kind of at an impasse. And that's why I would recommend that we pull a working group together to really thoroughly vet out everything that we want to do. Uh, by the way, once if we got uh, uh, somebody to to buy this, it would have to come to the board, and the board would have to approve that in an open meeting. So there will be other opportunities if we do decide to sell. Nothing saying that we will, but at least it gives us the opportunity to, to explore more. So where's Sean at? There he is. I just wanted to I just wanted to address your comment on uh, what members brought up the urgency to sell the campground. What brought that about? Part of my campaign in 2020 with another member was the campground. Let's start a conversation on what to do with the campground. That necessarily didn't mean to sell it, but what to do with it. Just three months ago, we had a member stand up and ask us, when are you going to make a decision on doing something with the campground? It's been sitting there for 30 years. When are you going to do something? So that sparked. Okay, there's an interest. And we also got into the conversation of revenue. How can we come up with revenue? There were a gazillion things. Miniature golf, uh, renting kayaks and John boats, all kinds of things. The largest one, the CDC recognized, was the possible sale of the campground. Now, I know somebody commented about all oh, Larry Henson and his rhetoric about promising things to the membership. I don't promise anything that I can't try and try and address and deliver. Just like Jay said, if the vote goes yes, it opens up a conversation. You can't do anything without a board vote. If the vote goes no, it opens up another conversation. And you still can't do anything without board vote. Jay's suggestion of a working committee, a working group, with the CDC, the finance, membership, board member, and staff member to answer all those questions that you just asked when the membership says, that's a great idea, let's sell it as a community. Then we start answering all those questions you asked. But it's not, again, my rhetoric. The board, it has to go through the board. So, like everything else, We'll listen to CDC, we'll listen to finance, but most importantly, we'll listen to you. That's not rhetoric, that's the way it is. So, great presentation, great thought out Absolutely. questions. I really appreciate it. And that was just like last week. So many good comments, so many smart people live at this lake. And I appreciate you guys come up and, and bring in those concerns and comments. It's just really good stuff. So. Yeah. One thing to add, we did look at doing something with the campground. I know uh, Judy brought forward uh, a proposal, and we looked at, uh, I think, putting a fence out there. Tom, how much, uh, what was the acreage? I think it was an acre. That I we think it was one acre fence. or two acres. And, 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 it was and get electricity and all that, and it was like 180000 to do that with not much guarantee of additional revenue. In order to put lighting and read, put in water and sewer, there have been close to $300,000. However, Tom and I have had several meetings with the county. Douglas Miles, who is in charge of planning, planning I asked him about our 11 acres. He said, you will not be able to just open it up the way you had it before. The rules around campgrounds have changed so much. He said, quote, Larry, do you know how much land people own in Flavana County that walk through that door and say, I want to make a campground out of my farm? And when they find out what they have to do to do it, we don't have any campgrounds around here. 
and we'd have to start all over. So just to get the water and sewer back and electricity, it was over almost 300,000. But who knows what it would be if we really wanted to try and reopen the campground. So anyhow, okay, Larry, good stuff, Sean. Larry, so I think that we've learned a lot from this whole process, but the reality is, is up or down, yes or no. There's, there's got to be a, a more formal uh, process Absolutely. put in place to vet uh, so many different questions so that we can proceed. So it's, to me, whether this is an up or a down vote, it, we've got to do that and to be able to move forward because whether it's sold or not or whether we vote yes or no, we want, it sounds like for me what I'm hearing is everybody wants to make at least a plan. Let's put a plan in place versus having it remain um, a non-performing asset for another 10 years. I don't think any of us really want that necessarily. There may be a few, but I'd like to see that property used for the residents. Um, if, it, if we keep it, I'd like to see it used for the residents. Where the board has a fiduciary or a, a fiscal, res fiscal and fiduciary responsibility to you all, and that includes finances, it includes the financial aspect, the fiscal aspect, no doubt. It's but it also important. includes, Sorry. it also includes our, are you, but are you getting, pop, popping me off the time? No, 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 no. <laughs> it also includes, it, for us, it includes our quality of life. Because with that, the fiscal is obviously the most important. But then, it, it, but in that, if, if our quality of life is high, and like Jay was just talking about the financials, the, um, the, the maintaining and increasing our real estate values, that's a big deal. And so all of that kind of mixes in together. A lot of times we look at numbers in black and white, and yet there's a lot of underlying um, uh, value in your quality of life and our real estate values being to increase. Now, when he was talking about 1.1, 1.2 billion? 1 billion, 286 million. Sorry. <laughs> a lot more. A lot more the zeros. Numbers yeah, those zeros started, in, and I am too, but those zeros added up a little bit. So when you think about that, that's the fair market value of the residences and the 28 million that the, uh, is on the balance sheet. That's a balance sheet number. Speaking to a numbers guy, mm -hmm. that's a balance sheet number. That means money's gone in. That, doesn't, that does not represent the fair market value of that property. The fair market value of that property is different. The lake alone is, has a value, but those are fair mar that's a fair market value. What's on the balance sheet is just the funding that's in this, in the, uh, the, that's gone through the financial statements. Okay, I'm done now. Thank you, Deborah. Next up, Jane, James Chester, are you here, Jane? There he is. Show now we got an announcement for you. <laughs> Thank you, Larry. You're welcome. So, Good evening. My name is James Schoenster, and I've been following this issue very closely and asked some questions at the last town hall to help with some of my analysis. Uh, for full transparency, I'm also running for the Fluvanna County Board of Supervisors. So first, I want to acknowledge how important these town halls are and how great a job our communications director, Marika, has been doing to make the, the residents aware. This is, as you mentioned, advertised in the Fluvanna Review, as well as via email and on social media. Can't speak for everyone, but I saw all three, and I'm here today uh, because I'm fortunate enough to have a very supportive wife who lets me come do fun things like this. Uh, communication is a challenge we face at Lake Monticello, but also countywide. It isn't easy, and avenues for the public to speak their mind are one of the many tools our board is utilizing, so for that, thank you. I also want to thank the Community Development Committee, or CDC, who gave their presentation at the last town hall. I know this topic didn't come out of nowhere and evaluating all the options took time and effort. I believe our board president mentioned last week as well as today uh, that uh, the members of the board have heard that we need to do something about the campground. It's, it's a common request. Uh, the CDC was tasked with evaluating the options and making a recommendation based on very specific goals. I hadn't seen the Finance Committee's uh, report when I composed this, but I want to recognize their hard work as well. Uh, you made compelling arguments today. It's due diligence, not a done deal. We're fortunate to have volunteers on the board and CDC willing to do the legwork and find what opportunities exist out there for our HOA. They took direction from us, did some analysis, gave us that analysis, 
ask for our opinions on that analysis, and finally we'll cast a vote. The income from the sale and more HOA fees should the homes be built as is being recommended is not insignificant. I asked last week about zoning because that would change how many homes are allowed to be developed on that lot and that changes the calculation. On one hand, it's projected 122 residential units would generate an additional uh, 142,000 in dues at the current dues level for the life of the LMOA. On the other hand, if it's denied by the Board of Supervisors and with current zoning, you would get about 50 homes, so 58,000 in dues. Those homes would require more expenses paid for road upkeep and security. Some say that would take about 30 to 40% of that income, but let's say over half to be conservative. Add in the revenue from the invested cash from the sale and you get either 60K a year or $100,000 a year towards maintaining our amenities. Either way, a significant increase from the three dollars to $5,000 that land is generating at the moment and worth serious consideration. But that's only through the lens of the HOA's finances and as someone paying close attention to county issues, I have to vote no. Vote no because Lake Monticello Road and our utilities are already being strained by more residents. We have to make sure our infrastructure can support the folks moving in and that's my number one priority. Vote no because available land near our community is finite and I'd like to see this land saved for opportunities other than more housing developments. Commercial use wouldn't provide as much direct income to LMOA, but it would benefit the community. And as Rick stated, we don't know what the county will do, but I'm advocating strongly for commercial development. Vote no, because without caveats or conditions, the benefits of the potential sale do not outweigh the potential costs. And in November, vote for me. <laughs> <laughs> because this is part of my vision for the community and for Fluvanna County. Sorry, I couldn't help myself. So I'll wrap up just by reiterating how grateful I am for our board for listening to us, our communications department for informing us, and all the volunteers on committees and the board for doing the work that a decision like this deserves. A no vote is not forever. A yes vote might be. Let's continue to do the work and find the best possible future for everyone. Thank you. Thank you, James. <clears throat> Any comments? Uh, thanks for running for the, the Board of Supervisors, James. Uh, you know, we have developed a lot better relationship with the county. Uh, uh, and, and go back to our police chief who came from the county. That's one of the things that this board kind of overcame is uh, uh, a problem with uh, police. We, did, we got down to where we only had one or two. Uh, we've got creative. We have five. We had budgeted eight. We're paying them a lot more, and I think we're getting outstanding service. So uh, I, I think we're trying to do all the right things and uh, looking at efficiencies, working with the county. Uh, we probably have a better relationship with the county and Aqua, even though uh, you know, we're holding them to task. But so I know Sean. Sean brought it up. So did James. I just want to touch touch base. Tom and I've been working pretty hard with aqua and i've been working pretty hard on them i don't know if you saw the last two or three board meetings where we invited them to come and answer your questions and the first time the guy showed up john albach the president he didn't have an answer to one of your questions not one that didn't set well to me so the meeting didn't go as he thought it was going to be because he didn't answer any of your questions. We brought him back. He did a better job. His assistant, Heather, has done a better job. We've uh, formed, reformed a group, thanks to uh, Deborah bringing it to our attention that we used to have a, a group that worked with Aqua, and they met once a month, talked about issues and, and those types of things. So we're going to bring that back. So, yes, infrastructure is a big deal, and I brought it up to... Francis Dahl, anybody that'll listen, it's growing up around us. I call it Lake Monticello Beltway. It's not just what's going on inside our gate that affects us. What goes on outside our gate affects us. Are we going to be able to maintain our amenities? How are we going to be able to control who's coming in here? Do we start charging money to come in here? I mean, there's all kinds of questions. So. Infrastructure is a big deal, and so is growth around us. That's why it's just not a blanket statement to say, yes, we're going to sell it, 
and the board votes to sell it. We've got to answer all of Sean's questions before we go, go down that route. So, James, thank you. Good stuff. And I'll vote for you. I will take it. <laughs> okay, next up is, uh, help me with this, Shosh Samuel Siegel. How'd I do? Shosh. Shosh. Okay, thank you. I'm sorry. Uh, I would like to echo others' thanks to, to all of you. I know it's not an easy place to sit uh, and having can you to make... Use, can you send, move the microphone closer to you? Yeah, and you're not the only allergy sufferer here, <laughs> by the way. Man, I'm telling you. Me too. Um, so, again, thank you. Um, I... Um, for the sake of brevity, I'm going to read what I've written. Um, where a lot has already been said about, that's good, about the uh, inadvisability of selling the campground uh, parcel from a financial standpoint. Just to summarize, um, we are considering selling the only real asset we have that is expected to increase in value year after year for little and at a time we are not in any financial distress. And um, the, um, I'm going back to Danny's presentation to us uh, last week um, and he talked about that at length and, and very well. Uh, he is also the one who mentioned uh, increasing the possibility of increasing uh, the dues and he calculated that the $800,000 that we are likely to receive for the parcel, once divided by the number of households, would translate to an increase of $10 or roughly $10 per household. That was, I am taking his word for it, uh, but I just want to put that in perspective so that we're not frightening uh, the membership by talking about the possibility of increasing um, dues in lieu of selling the property. But my focus today lies elsewhere. Uh, as a community, we pride ourselves on being good stewards of the environment. Among other things, we're not allowed to fell our trees willy-nilly. We have wildlife and beautification committees. We keep our lake and fishing pond clean and some other things. Why not extend that stewardship to the campground? Let's keep one of the few remaining wooded parcels in our area as is. Let its current residents maintain their precious homes. Let's use the campgrounds, as already suggested by others, for nature trails, possibly, for picnicking, as well as boat, trailer, and RV parking areas thus freeing space at the marina, <coughs> excuse me, preparing for these uses will likely require, and I did not do my homework entirely, but based on previous experience, will require very little financial outlay. <coughs> the existence of the campground seems to be, for me, an unintentional, well-kept secret. Homeowners and residents since 2010, we only now recently with all of this talk found out about it. I am confident that with effective dissemination of information about this wonderful asset, our asset, it will be fully utilized and enjoyed as yet another of our many amenities. Finally, an, uh, that is not going to be my finally, because I do have a question, too. <laughs> finally, at the May meeting, uh, there seemed to be much head-scratching happening over finding ways to effectively communicate with our members. The main concern expressed by one resident was that not all homeowners have or use email and the internet which have become the main means of communication with the membership 
I also happened to walk my dog and notice lots of uh, <coughs> the Fulvana reviews rotting away in people's boxes. So that certainly is not the safest way of communicating. I suggest that when it comes to matters that ask us to cast a consequential vote, a mailing detailing the issues, notifying of meetings, times, and locations, etc., be sent to each household. Only then we can, effect, we can expect each voter to be an informed one. And my question uh, has to do with legalities. Um, my understanding when it comes to voting is that once a vote is cast, the membership has spoken. And it seems to me to be a little topsy-turvy to say, well, let the membership speak, and if they say yes, then we will start investigating and figuring it all out. And then we can vote again, and what I sense already, just based on what's been spoken here, uh, both last week and today, is that there is, you know, you said we're not trying to persuade anyone to vote yes, but it sounded to me like a lot of persuasive talk in the direction of yes. And so what do we do with that? Are we voting yes because people <coughs> perhaps are misinformed, they think it's a great idea to get the money, and only then you're going to sit down and contemplate and investigate, and, um, and isn't that just a little bit too late? Uh, and especially putting it in the hands of a board that seems to already be leaning towards selling the asset. Thank you. Thank you. Any comments? Yeah. Go ahead, Drew. J just one comment. Uh, $800,000 divided by 4650, which is the number of residents, is about $215,000. Not a lot of money. That's basically what you would give up or not have to spend on other things. So it's a choice. It really is a choice. If, if you're willing to uh, believe that it's worth $200 uh, uh, member here to keep it as land, that's fine. We also need to keep in mind that if we're going to do any development there, that adds cost as well. That's what we're talking about here. There's nothing wrong with keeping it or voting to keep, for, keep it. It just adds a little more cost to the members. The second question and it sort of applies to everybody who's spoken at this point. What are we going to learn over the next year if we vote not to sell? We're not really ever going to be able to test the market. We aren't really going to be able to um, understand what the value of that land is. Uh, we can certainly keep it as a nature preserve or whatever we want to call it. And that's all up to each of the members to do that. But if you vote to sell, that's the beginning of the process, learning about what the options are, how it works, what are the impacts, all of those things, all of which will be discussed in board meetings. Yeah, it's not going to take, oh, go back out to a member vote, but that's why we elect a board. That's why we have a whole bunch of committees here to sort of adjudicate these things, to make the right sort of decisions for the community. If you ask 100 people an opinion, you get 100 different options. And that's, that makes things difficult to make any sort of decision there. It's hard to do that. So the point of, in my view, and I'm not on the board, I don't get a vote on this, but in my view, voting to sell only starts the process. If you believe we're going to get smarter in the next year or the next two years or find money to do something different with this land, that's probably not going to happen. If you're comfortable just keeping it as vacant land, that's fine. Vote that way. So I'm not trying to convince you to sell or to keep, but the decision is really that sort of, that's the size of the decision. We're not going to be able to do a lot of things with the property other than 
keep it as property, keep it as an investment. And if that investment appreciates faster than investing it in what we invest in, which is treasuries, uh, mutual funds, some equity funds, maybe it will. Can't answer that question because I can't see into the future that well. Anybody else? Okay. I, I'd like to say that I agree with you to a certain extent, Rick. Other, that the second, the, if the community wants to keep that property and do something else with it, that's going to be, um, that would be a special assessment that would be decided on by the community, that would be decided on by uh, groups that would study those types of things. There are 21 other issues on there on that list or 19 other issues on that list. There's more that can be done. But the, but the, what was given to this committee was come up with a proposal that could have short and long-term funding. That was, and this was the result of it. But if the, commun the community wants to gather and garner support to do something different, then that's up to the community. And I, be I really believe that Let me put it this way, the building that we're sitting in and the re re renovation of Ashlawn and the pool, yes, there was money taken out of a fund and yes, it was taken from funding and put into other assets, which are these assets we're sitting in. But if you take, to do that though, you to do something different, we would have to raise funding. So the community would have to say, yes, we want to have a special assessment to do whatever the project is. So I put that out there. So yes, it could be, and it could be left in per perpetuity, the property, or if you want to do something with it, it's going to have to come out of our pockets in order to do it. And that's a special assessment, and that's a vote. Thank you, Deborah. Next up is uh, Joan Cantor. How'd I do, Joan? All right. Come on up. And I'm going to, be, oh sorry, Joan Cantor, 578 Jefferson Drive. Um, and I'm going to be very brief because the three people who spoke before me really said just about everything that I had on my mind. Um, I think my main concern like a lot of people, is that I don't think we really want to say no, but we don't want to say yes yet because we have so many questions. And I, I wish that the I wish that the vote, um, the voting language would say um, that, do you agree for the board to explore? all the questions about selling the campground. If, if that was the vote, I would certainly vote yes. But if those questions are not explored, um, I certainly wouldn't be ready to vote yes um, yet. So, uh, and thank you for giving us the chance to meet with you and hear what you, you've put a lot of work into it. Um, and I think that the many in the community are just not as familiar as many you seem to be about the ins and outs of the decision. Um, and I think we need more answers before we're ready, some of us, before we're ready to vote yes. Thank you. Any comments? All right, so that, that uh, finishes up the people that uh, have signed to speak. We're almost at the end of our hour. I could take a couple of questions if you want. Um, this lady right here, she went up real quick. Bingo. Yes. I want to thank you very much for all the work that you did. It's fantastic and you've given us a lot of information. But I think um, there's one thing that most people who ran for the board said that they would listen to the community. And what I'm hearing coming to both of the town halls is an overwhelming sentiment of we don't like this proposal 
And then your response has been, well, wait a minute. If you don't vote for this proposal, then your assessment will go up. And I know you don't want to preach that way, but it, that's the way it sounds to me. For example, um, when you're talking about the assessments of the overall lake being uh, billions of dollars, well, that also reflects the inflation that you're saying is affecting your expenses. But it seems like you know, you're using inflation in, in two different ways. One, oh, we have this great asset here in the lake, yes. And that's good. But also you're saying, well, we have these expenses that, take the inf that are going to be going up, and therefore we need this money from the sale of the, of the campground. Also, I would like to ask the consent agreement. Can you publish who voted against <coughs> removing this proposal and who voted for removing the proposal? And can you have another consent agreement? Okay. Yeah, we'll, we'll do that in the uh, next board meeting. So th there will be an agenda item with, uh, with that information. I, I yeah, consent that. agreements are always part of the agenda. It's, and that'll be covered then. Uh, and, and the way consent uh, agreements work is, so you can't call a public meeting ever, you know, in some instances, and this one we couldn't, we didn't have the time. So you have to get 100% of the board members to vote in the, the way that the consent agreement is. Oh, I see. And we didn't get 100%. So the next step would be taking it to a public meeting, and then it's just a majority <coughs> vote. But we didn't have the time because the, the annual meeting voting starts Monday. OK, so we wouldn't be able to do another consent. OK, I understand. Thank you very much. Thank you. Time for a couple of more. The lady back there was second yes hi there my name is Lori Kowalski for Pine Knoll I live at um, I'm fairly new to the community so a lot of this is I'm just learning it um, I served on a HOA in my previous development that we lived in prior so I have knowledge as to how all of the finances work and all, everything you guys do and it is a thankless job and I understand that my questions are on financials so we want to sell the campground you guys are saying we want to sell the campground to increase our reserve fund how much do we currently have in our reserve fund today have that you go ahead and ask other <laughs> questions and I'll, okay uh, and then on the reserve fund do the people have to vote to spend that money or do you, does the board just decide what we spend that money on no the the board decides uh, a budget for spending that comes out of the reserves and that's done as part of the budget process each year it's based on the independent reserve study that Larry referred to, which is actually required by the state of Virginia, which goes through and um, you know assesses what are the things we're going to need to spend to maintain our infrastructure, and that's the starting point for it, and projects out by year when they think they're going to spend it. Now, that happens every five years. Five, five years. So there'll be an independent okay. one coming up, probably this fall or next spring. Now, of course, you know, everything doesn't wear out exactly as predicted, so it can move around. But the board, as part of annual budget process, projects budget is what, what they're going to spend uh, for capital, for infrastructure stuff that is funded by reserves. And that's done in public. There's public meetings to review the budget, and then, in fact, it's reviewed but in a But the people board. have no say. It's just all the board that it's to decide that, correct? Well, it's, it, again, it's, it's basically replacement of things that we have now that we are required to uh, maintain. It's not, you know, a whole bunch of new ideas that have come up. Uh, new ideas can be uh, presented and are presented in the board and members can come and talk. But 
almost all of the reserve spending is based on what's necessary to maintain the infrastructure we have here and you know, replace things like car vehicles you know trucks that do maintenance and right. lawnmowers that have to be replaced and all of that sort of stuff and it's laid out the reserve studies public it's on our uh, website and it's uh, presented on an annual basis as part of the budget so you do have a chance to voice your opinion we have usually three open meetings the finance committee will hold one to two uh, meetings where the finance director will present the budget to the finance committee that's an open meeting you can come here you can voice your concerns the you know then the finance director will go back and maybe make changes based on those concerns and opinions and then the board has two working sessions and then usually in November we vote on the final budget and what Mike uh, and Tom will do is they'll give a list of the projects like Rick said for the reserves that uh, that we'll do so we have a projected time frame but that doesn't mean we have to spend it we've got two million dollars that's projected for us to spend on an irrigation system out here for the golf course uh, two million dollars. I, yeah I don't know that we'll spend it so there's other but the thing is, if you don't spend that, the golf course goes to crap. And I can show you where we lost hundreds of thousands of dollars because we lost our golf course. So, you know, this is a, a golf and lake community. So we're, we're kind of required to replace, uh, you know, all of our stuff. So, yeah, there, there's a chance to voice the opportunity and that's an example of a very big expenditure a lot of the expenditures in this are like and that's a one in 40 years re replacing the HVAC system right. periodically for the building we're in replacing vehicles maintenance vehicles police vehicles that sort of stuff over a uh, you know, seven year period or something like that everybody knows cars wear out HVAC systems wear out these are not right. necessarily controversial issues but yes, you get a chance to see it and you get a chance to comment on it if you'd like to comment. Okay. So we have 5.5 million in reserves 5 .5 at the end okay. of 12 And how much do we put in our reserves every year from all of our annual income? So that's a little complicated, but member dues, there's about a million of the 4.6 million that goes into re reserves from member dues. It may be a little higher than a million. We've worked through some different funding because, as Rick was talking with Deb, we really need to be putting in about two million a year to to be fully funded. The last report said over 30 years we need to spend 72 million dollars on all of our stuff to replace it. Um, and you know, yeah, I'd mentioned before we're projected to run out in about 20 years. But so other funding comes from property transfer fee when we sell property here. Somebody mm -hmm. buys and sells it. Uh, there's $800 that goes mm -hmm. into property transfer. We used to use that just to build new stuff. Uh, back in 2020, we said we can't be buy building new stuff We've got to be using that money. And we put, I think, uh, 800000 from property transfer into our reserves. So um, we're, we're trying to work through different and, avenues. And we're investing that $5 million, $5 plus million, like you would the eight hundred that we're going to gain from the... Yeah, well, we've so got... that's already increasing. There's policies that we've got a policy uh, Cap Trust is our uh, investor, so they follow our policy on investing. And there's so much in terms of uh, equities, fixed income, uh, and so forth. So they have to invest that. We just moved money to them, and we're investing short term in some treasuries that are yielding 5.2%. So we're trying to work it as best we can and to be safe with that. CapTrust has, has been a very good partner with us. 
Okay. So I was just trying to calculate the, the sale of the campground versus the current reserves and why it's such a need it, as it, it's not you a, all are presenting it to me. No, it's it's not a current need, but it's you know, as Rick said, either you do something with it or you don't. We don't think we have money to do anything significant with it. It can sit and a lot of people think it will appreciate. Um, or we can sell it, see what the market is. I don't know. The market may be one and a half million. Somebody may come by and say, hey, we want to lease this for 100000 And that would be awesome. Uh, we get to keep the property and lease it. So again, then why wouldn't we go to the ballot saying that we give the board permission to review and to see what we can do with it before we actually say, yes, we want to sell it? Well, I mean, that's... And that way the people still have the final vote. It's not just up to the board well, completely. Well, it, it, it kind of ties your hands in terms of who you're uh, dealing with and what they want to do. If, if you don't have approval, this, you know, are you going to get all the necessary people to, to come knock on your door? And that's the reason when we go out for contracts that we have approval on contracts because people don't want to bid on it if uh, then it's got to go through another approval process. It, it's, it's, it's not easy um, and all we're doing is presenting the option to do okay. that. All right, well, thank you. Thank you. Okay, I want to take one more of the gentleman with the hat. We'll take one more and we're going to call it, uh, call it a night. How are you, sir? Thank you, sir. My, my name's Chuck Obermeyer. I've only lived here since 2014. But I bought that property in June of 1976. Now, I've camped on that campground lots of times. I bought my scout troop down here from Alexandria. Kids got their swimming merit badge in your lake. Uh, I was delighted when they put uh, a uh, latrine facility there with showers. And when somebody decided to put indoor outdoor carpeting in there, I'm sure the mosquitoes were delighted too, because that's the one went in there. Uh, and I used to use that for my trailer, but somebody uh, broke into my trailer and stole all my stuff. And that was just a security issue. So what do you have here? It's a dusty gem. All you need to do is clean the dust off of it and the thing will sparkle. There's a lot of things you can do with this property. It, it's sort of like my dad told me a story about the goose that laid the golden egg. People were starving and they decided to cook the goose. Well, that's what you've got there is a goose that hadn't just laid the golden egg yet. I really think you should hang out of that piece of property. I think with a little bit of love and care and some, some gentle work there without a lot of money thrown into it, you could still turn it into a piece of property that does some good for the community. People could put their trailers there, the boats and stuff. Um, you still charge a fee for that, which is extremely reasonable. I only paid like 200 bucks a year to put my, my trailer there, and, and they charge more than that a month at some of these other, other facilities around here. Keep the place. Keep it for the community. That's what it was intended for. Um, I really agree. Everybody else has really echoed everything, that all the concerns I had, um, and I agree with all of them. I would vote, don't sell it. Hang on to it. And thank you for your work. Thank you. Thank you very much. Ed had a question. I don't know if you saw him. Ed, did, do you still want to yeah, sure. ask a question? No, I didn't see him. Yeah. Thank you guys for doing this. I am new to these meetings, but it's definitely uh, stirred hornet's nest in the community. Um, I actually just took some notes tonight. And my name is Ed Lauterbach, 21 Sand Trap. 20-year uh, property owner, 20-year successful semi-business owner. <coughs> So it can be done in Fluvanna County. Don't be scared of that. Where's the Board of Supervisor guy? <laughs> so first of all, th thank you. A couple of items. You all covered it very well. Um, and I do represent Fluvanna Online, uh, Lake Monticello Neighbors, and um, Fluvanna Neighbors. Uh, it's a Facebook page with over 4,000 members. Been here a long time. I've seen some of these things go through pretty quick. The problem is vote yes, vote no. Most of the people don't vote, myself included, unless it's really important to you. So my concern is that this will go through without people 
knowing it's even going on. So, and that's hopefully we can all bring that to them and agree to that. Um, again, I am urging members to vote no for all the. I didn't hear one person say um, that they wanted to uh, sell this property tonight. I could be mistaken. Um, fiduciary responsibility was mentioned. I believe the whatever Larry, you're a numbers guy. This land is going to appreciate. You can't say in five years whether it's going to be half or not. We all know this county. There is no prime property left here. Once the circle is developed, hey, I'm a business owner. I want more spines. I want more of your bad backs. My trust me, I, will, I would like more houses, more opportunity. But our roads cannot handle this. Whatever, whoever agrees to buy this land, whatever they agree to do with it, I say we keep a green space. The gentleman before me. I think it's a golden egg. I think we're going too soon, too fast with it. Um, there are a lot smarter people than, than me, of course. People, maybe you're out there and you have experience in partnering with the community, the county, YMCA. Something can be done here. Green space, space is going to be at a premium. This land will double in value in four to five years. You can make your predictions. That's what, that's what I see. it. So I think financial uh, responsibility would be best to keep this asset. And the most important thing I heard tonight, uh, and another thing is land is hard to sell. That is not true. Trust me, interest or not, people are salivating over this land. Uh, I, I guarantee you that. Um, and one thing else I had, just in five years, again, I think this land is going to be uh, worth a lot more. I think we can come together uh, as a community. For now, just vote no. It's too soon, too quick. And I, I believe we have a better asset that we can that we can keep it green. I mean, what's it costing us? You, there is no crisis. That's all I heard tonight. No crisis. No immediate need. You said it. <laughs> yeah, I'm not you arguing with you. You said it. You guys all said it. There's no crisis today. Opening up the opportunity. Well, let's vote on the members saying open up the opportunity, or let the members vote next year on what that opportunity might look like. Maybe we want to keep a green space. Maybe pickleball. It's exploding. You can't even get on the court here. I don't play. My son is an expert at it. It's exploding. They just built a billion-dollar uh, pickleball center in, in Richmond. There are, like I said, there's smarter people than, than me, of course, but that, can, that have done these things. Northern Virginia people, every new patient I get, 6 out of 10 or 7 or 3 area code. So you're all here. You're smart. Let's get together and make this a difference. Let's do it for the community, but I, I think it's too much of an asset to sell right now, and it's worth more to us. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, Ed. You. Okay, so with that, that will close the question and answer period. What I would like to do is close the meeting and with comments from the panel, and we'll start with Rick Roth on the end. <laughs> You've all had some very good comments, and I think there were a lot of good comments there. To me, the choice is keep or sell. If you want to keep, keep it as an asset. If you want to keep it as green space, if you want to keep it for trails, all of that sort of stuff, that's great. That's fantastic. There's nothing wrong with that decision. Uh, you just have to recognize that what we're keeping it for is as an asset, as is. We really don't have a lot to invest in changing it, making it something different, creating something over there. And we probably won't have the funds to do that in the next foreseeable future. So the choice really is, if you want it, if you think it's worth something, if you think it'll be double in value next in the next five years, that's great. Make your decision to keep it. If you think uh, we're better off not keeping our assets in vacant land, then vote to sell and trust the process that will We'll go through to vet the opportunities to understand what's out there and maximize the return from a financial standpoint to the members. Hopefully that helps you think about this anyway. Thank, Thank you. Deb? I really don't have a lot to add to the conversation right now. Okay. Jack? Uh, I want to thank everybody that came up and uh, spoke today took the time, uh, everybody was well thought out, presented their, their side very well, and I appreciate that. I want to thank the, the staff. I, I know Tom and his staff uh, really put a lot of time 
into uh, these town hall sessions, uh, the information, taking in the questions and so forth. And then the committees, I think uh, Tom Diggs and the CDC committee, I, they've just been a wonderful committee and that we're fortunate to have them. Uh, I think they did an outstanding job. The finance committee uh, did good work around, always does good work. Um, you know, these things are not easy. You know, we're we're kind of making sausage and it's not, uh, it's not always pretty. Um, but we're moving forward. We got a conversation going uh, about this, and uh, we'll see. Uh, you know, I, I've been on the board for four years, uh, audit committee for another two years, and yeah, you know, we've talked about the campground, but nothing's ever really happened. So uh, I'm just glad we're starting to talk about it, and we'll see how it moves forward. Yeah, I just, uh, I just echo. One about Tom and the CDC committee and Brick and the Finance Committee. Thank you all for both of you for all the hard work and effort you put into it. We listened to you. We couldn't do it without you. Tom Shouter and his team, they've been over backwards the last month helping us bring this to light. Um, thank you all for the way you spoke tonight. It was great, positive stuff. Should not be controversial. It's either yes, you want it, or no, you don't. But I can guarantee you this. These guys told me, and I asked the question, if we vote no, is it a done deal? We can't do anything about it. We meaning you guys. If it's a yes, is it a done deal? We can't do anything about it. We can do something about it either way. There's got to be a final vote with the board, but how do you get to that vote? We go through the committees, and we go through the membership. So there's, well, I'm going to tell you something, I've been on the board for almost three years, don't nothing happen fast here. <laughs> and that's by reason. And with this board, I think some of you remember past boards, we didn't allow people to speak. We cut them off. We allow people to speak and we have since day one, this board took over. We allow people to stand up and talk. I'm not going to cut you off. So, with that, I thank the membership. You guys are, you're awesome. You brought a lot of good stuff to light. Tom? I really appreciate the gentleman in the back who read the report of the Community <laughs> Development <laughs> Committee. Thank you. Uh, the rest of you, I encourage you, should you have insomnia, please look for it. The, the consent motion that Larry mentioned was to consider pulling this issue from the vote. A reason behind that uh, was alluded to uh, in the bottom of the box on that slide because after last week's meeting it just happened to be the day before last week's meeting was the day before the May meeting of the Community Development Committee. The members spent quite a bit of time discussing what occurred and based on a variety of factors that I will not recite here, they made the motion to ask the board to withdraw the vote for this year. And that was a significant, uh, uh, let me rephrase that, I can't say it was a significant, it was a reason that the board was considering withdrawing the vote. Thanks, Tom. Mm -hmm. When is the vote? When is the vote? Starts, <laughs> starts May 22nd. Monday. Monday. Online. Yeah. You have a month to vote, right? Yeah, you, it's not one day. It's yeah. all the way to June 24th. I think. No, no. This, look, Something the like that. June 15th. June 15th. Yeah, so three weeks. Three weeks. How is, how is the motion presented? How will it be written out? 
It, it'll be in the, in the documentation. I, I think we covered some of that today. It's in the slide. Yeah, it will be right but, there on your ballot, exactly what I read. It's right there. Yeah. So it's, it's in person opportunity to vote for those who don't have otherwise access to Yes. Yes. There's paper ballots. You can go to the to Ashlawn and walk in. There'll be a an area that you can vote there or you can vote online. So yes. Okay, Tom Chowder. I just thank everybody for their comments. We, uh, Marika does a great job, works very hard. Um, we're open to ways to get to the community. Um, I just say there's, between these two town halls, we've had about 60 people. We have 4,500 homes, 12,000 residents. We encourage people and we always hear we can communicate better. Uh, like I said, we're trying to reach everybody. Uh, we're trying to get information out there, post it on the website, provide copies, et cetera. Uh, we'll continue to do that. Um, I, I give the board and the committees lots of credit working with them. Um, they work hard. Uh, you have seven board members that are governing body. I think people need to realize that seven votes uh, and there's processes we follow. So we're trying. I know people say it takes too long, you take too long, it's hard, they're not getting the information. Um, we're open to constructive criticism and uh, the process is in place for a reason and we're trying hard to reach you all so you make a, an educated vote. So thank you all. So with that, meeting's over, but thank you very much. Thanks for coming. Thank you.